Okay, I know that last step took us a really long time. It's really tedious walking through all of our test cases and going through every step of logic in our solution. But it's important that we practice because we're going to have to do this in the interview. And we don't want to stumble and make mistakes because that eats up a lot of our time. So practice makes perfect with this one. After this step, our interviewer is going to ask us about the space and time complexity of our solution. Looking at this, we should see right away that we have two for loops, one nested in the other. This should ring some bells in your head, telling you that the time complexity is at least O of n squared, because two for loops is pretty much the hallmark of n squared time complexity. So you might be wondering, this second for loop, though, doesn't touch every element. If P1 was in the middle of our array, P2 can only ever be in the latter half of this array. It can never touch what's on this side. So how is this still n squared? Doesn't that matter? It actually doesn't. Imagine that our nums array had four more elements added to it. If there were four more elements, what happens to our code? Well, the first for loop is going to get four more loops. The second for loop is also going to get four more loops, meaning that for every additional loop, that gets added to this first one, we're touching four extra elements every time, meaning that we have an exponential increase in our solution. So this is why we have a time complexity that's exponential. What about space though? What about our space complexity? Well, with space complexity, we really see that this is the only thing that we're storing in memory, our number to find value. We're not actually really caching any other values in memory. And even if our nums array were to increase, this number to find doesn't really grow. We're just storing that one number in memory. And that number changes every time our P1 changes. So we actually have a space of O of 1, which as we remember from our big O notation, is the best complexity we can achieve. So when we present this to our interviewer, our interviewer will now ask us, can we come up with a better solution? Which leads us to step eight, optimize. Well, just by looking at our time and space complexity, the moment we see that one of them has n squared or worse complexity, we know that there probably is a better solution. n squared is actually really bad complexity. Whether it is for space or time, that's a big hint to us that we can come up with a better solution. The other hint that tells us as to how we can optimize is by looking at these two complexities. We can see that our space complexity is actually really good. We have the best space complexity possible, which means that is there a way for us to make our space complexity worse in order for us to improve our time complexity? And this is a good technique to use. If you have one complexity that is far better than the other, at least in the sense of a reasonable range, like what we have here, then you know that you can probably make one worse in order to make the other better. So what we want to do here is we want to use up more memory and take up more space so that we can bring the time down. Now we know that the culprit of our time complexity is these two for loops that we have. So is there a way for us to remove one of these for loops in order to bring it down to just one for loop while leveraging our memory? Well, that's actually exactly what we're going to do for our optimization. Here I've just cleaned up our board a little bit, but let's think about breaking down these two for loops into one for loop. In order to do that, let's figure out what each for loop is doing. The first for loop, calculates our NTF. So here we calculate that number to find. And I'm just going to use the abbreviation NTF. The second for loop checks if the current number is equal to that NTF number that we have. The reason why we even need this second for loop, other than doing the task of checking, is because we only store this number to find value once. 
When we initialize our first for loop and we set this number to find value, we loop through every other number in the array, comparing it against this one. But this kind of seems inefficient, doesn't it? This is actually a great time for us to use a hash map. And if you remember with a hash map, a hash map has a lookup of big O of one time, meaning that it's pretty much instant. And this is really good for us because this means that what we can do is we can calculate this number to find value in our first step and store it in here. So in the case where our first iterate is on the number one, we know that the number to find that we get out of it is 10. The actual value to this, we're gonna figure out later. But let's say we just store 10 in here. Then what we'll do is we will move on to the next number. And what we'll say is that, let's just check first. Let's use this task and check if this current number is equal to anything inside of our numbers to find. That's what we'll call this thing. Well, we know that three does not equal 10, which is the only number we've saved so far. So let's calculate the NTF for this number three. So 11 minus three is eight, and we'll store it in here, and then we'll move on again. Does seven equal any of the numbers inside of our numbers to find? It doesn't equal 10 and it doesn't equal eight. So then we will repeat the first task and we'll calculate a new number to find. 11 minus seven is four, we'll store it, and then we will move on. Now we're gonna repeat our second task when we're on our new number and say, does nine equal any of the numbers inside of our numbers to find? It doesn't equal 10, it doesn't equal eight, and it doesn't equal four. So then we're going to repeat our first task, calculate the new number to find, which is two, and then we're gonna move again. And now when we repeat our second task, we'll see that it does equal two. So it looks like we have a working solution. But the one thing that we also have to notice is that we've gotten rid of this second for loop now. What about P2? The way that we returned this answer before was because we had two pointers, one pointing to the first number and the second pointing to the one that we were iterating through. Now that we've moved away from having our second pointer, how do we make sure that we can still return the two indices? Well, this is where we need to leverage our object. And let me show you how we can do that. So, Remember how earlier I said that we don't have to worry about the value? Well, now is actually where we do. So if we had our object, the key, which is what we will use to look up against our iteration through our array for these NTFs is going to be based off the key being the actual numbers to find themselves. The value is going to be the index of the number that created this number to find. So one created 10 because one is the opposing pair to 10, and we're gonna store the index of that number, which was zero. Then when we moved on to three, eight was the number to find that got created, and the index of three is one. Then when we moved on to seven, seven's opposing number to find was four, and the index of seven was two. And then nine opposing number to find is two. And this index is three. And now you can see that when we do this second check right here, we're just gonna check against this object using our zero, our big O of one lookup, find this two, and then return this index. So now we have the current number we're on, which is this two, and then we have the opposing index that generated this number to find that we had. And doing that, we can now return three and four as our solution. So hopefully that made sense. What I want you to do is try and code this yourself. In the next lesson, I'm going to show you how I would code it, but we have all of the logical steps here. 
I want you to try and see if you can take these steps and turn it into code and compare it against my solution in the next lesson.